So here we are to talk a, a little bit more about the past. Um, and I've got a fabulous panel of speakers for you, but I get to say a few words before we commence. I have to say, in thinking about what I was going to say in introducing this, um, I was offered up the perfect uh, opener this morning when I received an email. Can I just point out from no one in this faculty or no one in this audience, um, someone who decided to provide to me some links about articles that had appeared in the popular press about what our cities would look like if women had designed them. It was a male. Um, and I, I went through various emotions this about this, and then I sort of looked at it and thought to myself, how do you know they weren't? Because they probably were, and you're making an assumption that women haven't been around over time. And what a load of bullshit that is. <laughs> My, as I introduced myself yesterday, I, I referred briefly to my PhD, and um, so it was on the history of women architects in the state of Victoria, so where we are. Uh, and at the time, and we are talking um, mid-1990s, I couldn't believe that no one had written the history. And I thought, what an opportunity for me. But it was presented to me as a topic, well, we don't really know. There might have been a few. So I, I, I took it on myself and I went, right, OK, I'm, I'm going for it. And of course, found heaps of women working. And they'd done really interesting things. And the first woman qualified as an architect in Australia in 1902. And we've had women working as architects continuously ever since. But not very many people know about them. Uh, so when I went on to write a book, and I, I, can, I can talk for hours confidently on this, but I can assure you that it won't. Um, but it, it, it brings that question as to why should we look at this? And I have to say, when I was a PhD student, one of my esteemed colleagues said to me, well, why look at women architects? Why not look at redhead architects? And I said, sure, <laughs> why not? just as valid a category, I guess. But I've chosen to look at women architects, and that's what I'm going to do, and you can, yeah, anyway. Um, I don't know that anybody's taken that opportunity up, but I, look, I put it to you as a great opportunity to look at um, an underrepresented category uh, in the professions that probably needs a lot more work. But we've gathered here today a fabulous panel of women uh, who have been looking at uh, women engaging in the built environment over time. And in uh, bringing the panel together, I, I put a number of questions which appear in, your, um, in, in, in the program. As, and they, the questions are these. How and why do we recover the histories of women's active participation in shaping the built environment? Well, as I said, we know they've been there. Why do we do this? How does such knowledge reshape our understanding of the past, but also the present? Because it does. And what are the barriers and assumptions and disciplinary norms challenged by rewriting the built, built environment histories? Because I have to say, in my PhD, what I found is it was partly the way that we had conceived of the architecture profession as the lone genius, out there, creating their vision, like Howard Rourke in the Fountainhead, that really obscured where women had worked. And of course, it'll be no surprise to this audience, architecture is generally a team sport. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of people on the team and they're doing lots of different things. So why is it that we pick one name, usually the person who owns the firm, and say they did everything? It just obscures what other people have done, what their very important contributions have been, um, and it changes the nature and, way, and the way we think about the architecture profession and the built environment professions um, to give a very skewed view. And of course, when we talk about it in that way, our students see it in that way, and they think that's what they have to be too. And if they're not, there's some kind of failure. So 
we have to think differently about how we present the profession and how we value people who work within it. And I think history actually prizes that apart. So rather than me introduce each member of the panel, I've invited each of them to give us a little bit of inf a little presentation, not a huge one, about what they're doing and what what they're finding. And in, I've been a bit sneaky, so rather than double up in terms of introductions, I'm going to get them to talk about themselves and what they do. So, Jude, can I invite you first? Okay, hello everyone. Um, so yeah, my name's Jude Barber and um, I'm an architect by day and um, I work at um, the practice called Collective Architecture. Those were in the previous session, I talked about it very, very briefly. Um, and we're based in Scotland in uh, two studios in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, and sort of in parallel with um, studio practice, I also do kind of a, a a number of projects, and um, one of the, the projects I really want to talk about today um, that I'm very, very close to my heart is um, Voices of Experience. Um, and this is a collaborative project that um, was initiated by uh, myself, Suzanne Ewing, um, and Nicola McLaughlin. And we work as a, as a team um, to, uh, to, d to sort of develop this project. And it's, it's hard, it's sort of experimental, it began as a pilot. Um, and it began in 2016 um, as part of Scotland's um, first architectural fringe, which was a sort of fringe festival um, that was a sort of critique or a parallel uh, uh, project in response to the kind of um, f formal uh, festival of architecture that had been organised by our professional body. And um, what our project was hoping to do was really to uh, respond to the kind of continued lack of recognised female presence and role models that we saw within that programme particularly, but just generally within um, public life and conversations that were happening uh, within formal institutions and public flat platforms at the time. So... Um, Actually, the project itself is really quite a, a straightforward attempt to provide an alternative way about, you know, alternative way of maybe talking about architecture in place. And it really is just the start um, of an investigation, really, of women, particularly in Scotland, who've made important contributions to uh, architecture and the built environment. Now, um, at the kind of heart of the project, um, is what we call conversations, and this is part, you'll see parallels, obviously, with Parler's work and the wonderful conversations they, they do. Um, um, but what, what we do very particularly in, in our conversations is that we bring together a very experienced practitioner um, or maker of the built environment, and that's his broad, uh, broad, broad term, um, and somebody who's really at the outset of their career, somebody who's just embarking on their, on their journey um, uh, through their work. And what we do is we record them <laughs> um, with the aim of building and disseminating an, an audio archive or a series of transcripts, we'll talk about that in a second, um, of, of this conversation. And we're very uh, fortunate to be supported by the Glasgow Women's Library, which is the only accredited um, museum and archive to women's history in the UK. Um, but the format of these conversations is really simple. Um, but we do have a method, so uh, it's not an interview for a start, it's a facilitated conversation. The person, I've been a facilitator in several times, so you're very much in the background, and that's to encourage having a sort of intimate, get into that sort of intimate level of discussion. Um, participants are paired um, based on a common interest that they might have, or a thematic concern very particular to their work and their practice. Um, we record on location, we are technically, uh, it's pretty rudimentary, <laughs> but um, it's almost important in a sense that that, that tech, technical recording is in the background. Um, and we pose a series of questions, very simple questions, um, about getting into architecture, um, people who may have influenced the work, and any sound advice, for example. It's a very particular set of questions. Um, and there's a lovely quote within Bell Hook's 2010 book, uh, Teaching Critical Thinking, Practical Wisdom, uh, which says, genuine conversation is about sharing, the sharing of power and knowledge. It's fundamenta fundamentally a co cooperative enterprise. It not only makes room for every voice, it also presupposes that all voices can be heard. 
Um, so, you know, we've carried out these conversations and we've been doing this now for three years. We try to do about four a year. That's about all we can probably cope with. It's a voluntary project. There's only three of us at the moment, although that is growing. Um, but we also heard events and discussions at various venues, such as the Lighthouse Centre for Design and such like in Glasgow. The first event, we had a sort of coffee morning, um, which was really good, um, where participants and uh, audience members were really in a, in, 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 in a broader conversation as, as well, where we listened back to some snippets of recordings and kind of discussed those and enriched those conversations. And we've had other ones since. Um, 2018, we had... Um, an event, She Makes You Changes, which where we screened Sarah um, Akebogan's um, film, um, she, she Draws, She Builds. And um, we've also had events with historians such as Diane Waters, um, Elsie Owusu, and we've had um, co-founder Selassie Satufi from Black Females in Architecture up in Glasgow as well, so that's been great. Um, we also... Um, are starting as well to, to do something we call Investigation Room, where we're trying to sort of... Uh, find, working with a curator's panel, um, set up sort of workshops and looking through archives to, to try and find these women um, uh, that, that, that we hadn't really heard of before, but we, we knew who were, the, were there um, through process of sort of searching, we call it sort of searching, reading and listening. And this is exploding archives. And, you know, what's this really highlighted to ourselves? You know, I'm not from an academic background. You know, you start reflecting back on your own education and what you were told or what you weren't told. And um, I think one of the things that we've been finding really problematic is the, the you know, how you uh, find records of women. So, for example, we have the Register of Scottish Architects in Scotland. It's an online uh, forum. And, you know, so few women on there. And, and when you look back at, you know, how these women are, who are there are recorded, you've got, for example, Margaret Brodie, daughter of, sister of, um, who actually was one of the first qualified women architects in Scotland, and she designed the Women's Pavilion at the 1930 Empire Exhibition in Glasgow. But it says about her that although she was tall and extremely good looking, <laughs> even in old age, she never married. So there you go. There you go. So. Um, so, you know, how we document, how we record women's achievements is, is also critical. And this is something that we're very much interested in talking more about. Um, and another thing that we've just started doing recently is sort of mini, sort of small exhibitions, is trying to sort of plate our strengths, I, I would say, um, in thinking about how we document and, 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 and show... Um, show work and um, so we've just completed a little exhibition called Mementos of a Working Life um, and this was a very small what we thought was quite a straightforward project where we asked our participants, our, our uh, more experienced elderly participants to, um, to donate a, an artifact or a memento that sort of uh, reflected something about their working life with a, a reflective text and the objects um, were mixed with sound clips um, and their stories, and the kind of, I mean, we were really surprised at some of the things that came through from that. They ranged from Kirstine Borland, a planner, architect, um, who wanted her um, 1968 Murray Firth regional plan uh, contents and um, list uh, shown because she was trying to demonstrate that it was a broad and rich team that she worked with in, and she didn't want anything that just represented her own self. Margaret Richard, who provided her 1958 pictures from her six-month European tour with her husband and partner, John, um, and articles and cuttings from Joyce Dean, the first and only female president of the RAS. And um, as part of that exhibition, we had a, an essay um, uh, commissioned by uh, the wonderful uh, Dr Elizabeth Darling. And I'll just read one final thing um, that she said within, this, um, within her essay. She said, um, not seeing will no longer be an option. And thus, the young woman architect will have no doubt that she stands on the so shoulders of many giants, is following a path already trodden, and in which she can make further inroads. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jude. That was amazing. And thank you all for being here after the really fun and inspiring lunches. You made it back. That's amazing. Um, so I'm Sarah Rafson. Um, I'm from um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm an editor and I'm a writer, a curator, um, and I combined all those things into a, a business called Point Line Projects. Um, and I do work, I'm, I sit on the board of Architects, which is a, a gender equity advocacy organization in the spirit of Parlor, but um, we really have a lot to, to learn from you guys and a collaborator with you guys too. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, my 
approach to challenging the canon. Um, I, you know, it kind of fits well into this um, panel. Good work, everyone. Um, I because I've begun to, I've decided to look at the way that the canon is challenged through exhibitions. I see exhibitions as a really important way that can reinforce narratives about the way, about history and the stories we tell ourselves. And I also see it as an important way that we can counter um, the way that we talk about architectural history. And some of my work, like um, with the Karyatids, which I'll talk about in a second, you see here, um, has been uncovering histories to expand the way that we even think about the way that an an exhibition can be activist. Um, so, without further ado, um, when I was in graduate school, I was desperately looking for a thesis topic. I was scrolling, scrolling, scrolling through the archive of, uh, the International Archive of Women in Architecture, looking for a topic, and then these words jumped out at me. Chicks in architecture refuse to yield to atavistic thinking and design in society. I was like, what? I have to know more about this. This was just an entry in the, um, in the archive, and there was really very little press about it. It was an exhibition done in 1993. And, um, you know, it, there were postings in the press, um, but really, how could I have gone through architecture school and half of graduate school without knowing that there was some Thing like this. The Karyatids were a collective of over 70 men and women architects in Chicago. Um, and what they did was, it was a really short-lived grassroots um, protest to the AIA's convention that year, which was the largest convention ever of architects to that point. Uh, and it happened to be presided by uh, Susan Maxman, who was the first woman president of the National AIA. So you'd think, oh, woman president, all the women, let's, get, let's rally behind her. Well, the Karyatids had a bone to pick. They uh, staged this counter exhibition to ask the AIA to take up issues like the wage gap, the glass ceiling, family leave policies, gender bias treatment on the job, sexual harassment in the workplace, family leave policies, and attrition rate by women. All things that we've already talked about are still really valuable discussions today. Um, and what struck me is that this is a very architectural exhibition, but what you see is there's not no architecture on view. Um, there is a history, historical timeline, and I could really go into detail if you really wanted to know. I have a thesis I could send you about each of these sculptures. But what was so important to me was doing the oral histories with the founders to find out how three women who were low-level employees in big Chicago firms decided to take matters into their own hands and stage an activist exhibition, which they, they described as a raised middle finger to the AIA. So if, and sorry for the blurry um, photo, but if that was a sort of blip in the historical narrative, n barely ever existed uh, in history books, um, this was one that, thank you Sharon for introducing this yesterday. Um, you'll remember if you were here at Sharon's talk uh, that this was, a, a, this was the complete end of the spectrum. This, if we have a canon of women architect, uh, architects, uh, histories of women architects, this is, part of it. Um, it's, it was the first major exhibition of the history of women architects. It was expansive, as Sharon said, and this book, the, the catalog that came out of it, is still really one of the most vital um, resources for talking about the history of women, which, you know, begs, you know, this, it's being followed by a lot of the important work we're going to be talking about here, but this was one of the important touch points. It was um, organized by Susanna Torre, and in 2017, um, a group of us at Architects realized it was the 40th anniversary of this exhibition. Um, a good colleague of mine, uh, Andrea Merritt, is doing her, she's just defended her PhD on the history of feminist uh, or activism in the 1970s, and this was a really crucial starting point. So how do we acknowledge the importance of this exhibition? When we thought about it, we said, well, let's do another exhibition about women in architecture, and let's make it expansive the way that Susan and Atore did. But you know what? We kind of looked around, and we looked at all the different organizations that were popping up all over the world, and the way that discussions of women in architecture had evolved, and we were th thinking, you know what? It's not really as radical to do an exhibition, even of expansive women architects. It really wouldn't convey the spirit or the revolutionary potential of this kind of exhibition. So what we decided to do instead was start organizing an exhibition really devoted to the spirit behind Susanna Torre's action. It's called, Now What? Advocacy, Activism, and Alliances in American Architecture Since 1968. Um, and it debuted in 2018. And what it was, um, 
I mean, it's still traveling, so it's a traveling show. Um, what we decided to do was make, to acknowledge the fact that so many histories, like the Caryatids, remain to be written, unwritten, you know, they are still unwritten. Um, so what we have is an exhibition that, is, that tells the little-known history of advocacy and activism in American architecture, talking about the ways that architects have taken up the mantles of the civil rights, women's, ecological, LGBTQ liberation movements, and applied it through their practice. Um, we ha it's a timeline that wraps around the room. We have um, garnered stories from a, a network of, um, of activists, historians, educators, his and, and many more. Um, and we attempt to show a more complete picture um, than we usually see. Usually the story is told um, along the lines of gender and race and sexuality, and we decided to honor the spirit that crosses up between those um, in many ways throughout the country. And part of the reason that this is a traveling exhibition, and it's important that it's a traveling exhibition, is because there are so many gaps in the history. Um, so many of these stories, like I said, need to be written, so the exhibition itself is a, a, a tool to sort of pick up stories and spur the writing down of memories um, from people who came by. Actually, Sharon, uh, <laughs> Sharon Sutton was um, a speaker in our LA exhibition, and we got over 50 uh, suggestions for additions to our timeline, and I think she might have been responsible for 25 of them. <laughs> so thank you, Sharon. Um, so just to breeze through, I um, you know, was tempted to go through and tell you about everything on this slide, and I still would really love to, but I think I would just give you a, a sense of what the exhibition is about. It's not, we start with um, the, in 1968, we actually don't start with Susanna Torrey's exhibition, because in 1968, civil rights leader Whitney Young was, um, addressed the National AIA Convention and accused all of its members of thunderous silence uh, in, in face of pressing historical issues at that time. And this is just a, a smattering of ways that architects have taken up that mantle, whether it's WISPA, which Sharon also brought up yesterday, or the Architects, Designers, Planners for Social Responsibility, or um, the Architecture Lobby and its ma newish manifesto, um, or the, you know, uh, radical practices, design practices of uh, people like Liquid Ink or F Architecture, and the new, uh, you know, re newly revived discussions around black women's organizations um, carried forward by people like Tiffany Brown from Detroit. So uh, I'll just leave it there because we have a lot we can talk about. Um, and that's it. Uh, I'm Madhvi Desai. I have come from Ahmedabad, India. And I want to thank uh, Justin and Julie for putting in great efforts to bring me here. Uh, we were allowed uh, five slides, but uh, I sneaked in one <laughs> slide. Uh, this is myself in first year architecture in Ahmedabad. But it is symbolic because as we all have been speaking, what I'm going to talk about is the personal becoming political. So in my 30s, I was struggling with being a mother of two kids and trying to run a practice with my husband and uh, dealing with the marginalization in academics was the time when I got interested or got frustrated and started reading feminist literature. And that was the time I got interested in uh, gender and architecture from my, you know, very personal thing. In 1990s, with a group of other women architects, we established what was called Women Architects Forum, but it lasted about five years. However, everybody took something from it and we developed some sort of a network. In uh, 2002, we, along with a friend of mine, uh, we had the very first symposium possibly in South Asia on gender and the built environment. And based on that, this particular book came up. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, which deals with, you know, I have been dealing with 
two basic broad issues, women as users of space and women as designers of space. So this one dealt with that where, I have, where uh, several people contributed essays. The main problem I think in a patriarchal society like India is that they can relate to rapes and sexual violence and dowry, uh, deaths and uh, killing, uh, honor killings, etc. But the gender discrimination is invisible and very subtle. And mostly, if you are not aware, you are not sensitive, you just don't see it. And these are, you know, some of the examples which I have displayed here. I have very little time, so I'm not going to go into detail. I also want to say that I'm editing another book which should hopefully come out next year, which is looking at gender and the Indian city. And my concern has come not, of course, because of my interest in gender and the built environment, but because we are rapidly urbanizing and there is zero talk about, you know, how women will deal with cities. So, you know, I'm again trying my best to put, you know, some thoughts and some chapters together. And I'm also looking for design opportunities, which I have not found so far. Women's movement in India. I have specifically included this slide here because it is quite unknown in the design professions. So if you see, if you see the first uh, uh, photograph on the left-hand side, uh, it, this was the situation at the beginning of 20th century. You know, women lived in joint families, had uh, four, five, six children, and, you know, it was a very patriarchal setup. Then came Gandhi in 19... about, you know, uh, he led the freedom struggle, and in about 1940s, on the third photograph, you can see women coming out in mass and participating in the freedom struggle. And this was when they broke the shackles of the household and they came and participated in the public realm. And then, of course, many things happened post-independence. The last two photographs are, you know, entrance into architecture. Uh, you can see the change in proportions. I think all over the world, uh, we have at least about 50% women students, but of course they are not reflected in practice. I want, I brought this, I included the slide because a women's movement in India was not very homogeneous or very graphic or visible like in the West. And again, as we all know, uh, gender neutrality is accepted in the built environment as well as the designers. They also very strongly believe, the men and women, that, you know, what they design is gender neutral. So, because there is no connection between the women's movement and the disciplines of architecture, planning, etc., they have not realized. So, the whole feminist theory has been kind of left on the side. And also, it is a big problem to call yourself a feminist in India except for, of course, certain section of the society, because, again, they um, relate to it as the Western concept of burning the bras and breaking of families, etc. So it's kind of looked down upon. But I think it's very important that this becomes part of our architectural education. Then I come to this, my recent book, and I think this book is probably the reason why I'm here. Uh, throughout my teaching career, I would ask uh, the students, you know, who, which women architects do they know internationally and nationally? And internationally, they would say Zaha Hadid and just about stop there. And in India also, they struggle to come up with uh, even five names of women architects. So, I took upon myself to do this book without uh, institutional support or hardly any funding, and it took about 10 years. So, uh, what we have on the top here, uh, Perrin Mystery, is uh, probably the first uh, 
woman architect who joined uh, architecture in 1936 in Mumbai. Then we have Yuli Choudhury who worked with Le Corbusier, but you know I had no, even I myself throughout my career had not heard about her till I started digging and doing research. Gira Sarabai here, she's the only one alive. She's in her 90s, <laughs> and this is her project. She worked with uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright for about six years. You can see some impact of that. Pravina Mehta was the only one I had heard about when I was in school in late 60s and 70s, but I didn't pay any attention, you know, because I was again very. I did not realize what I was going to face once I joined the real world. And Hema Sakalya was again a rebel. Uh, she just passed away recently, and I've had you know, problem putting this together because there are, there are no archives still recently in India. These women themselves did not value their own work, so hardly any uh, drawings exist. And a lot of the buildings uh, were also not preserved. I also found, I, I have looked, uh, while doing this book, I also tried to look at a little bit of the personal history and not just the professional, because as we've seen, they are quite connected. So I found that they were of elite background, and that is how they could do what they do. They had uh, parents who supported their education, and they were rebellious. But the most important thing I found is that their value as pioneers goes way beyond the buildings. So this is where we really need to value history. So these were what I call the early narratives in the book. And then I have 28 uh, contemporary practices. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into this. Some of these are uh, probably well known. But all of these had to uh, really work very hard to get become successful. And I, again, we, I find a lot of commonalities with uh, all the presentations here, like uh, the patriarchal culture of the profession, the male architect as the designer, lack of role models and conscious mentoring that we need. And, you know, uh, but there is a whole body of work which is now coming up. And I call this the second generation. Unfortunately, with my limitations, I could not uh, study the the third generation, because the young women are now doing good work. And also, um, I also have, which I cannot include here, some design uh, conclusions about how they have looked at modernism, but have taken off and come out with their own design identities towards transformative action, a definite paradigm shift with social and professional conditions is already happening. So I don't want to just be negative. I have found that there are many changes which are happening. Middle class parents are ready to send their daughters uh, for work out of town, which was not very easy before. There are traveling uh, uh, facilities which are there, etc. So, but I think that it is still very, very slow. Change is very slow. And I have some of these uh, suggestions. In education, the women are more ambitious than ever, and they are delaying marriage, they are delaying having children uh, to succeed. Lot of changes need to be done in the curriculum. And the design studio projects, we need to give uh, projects which deal with women's issues. Uh, women's leadership is very important, and their visibility everywhere in the profession. They need to be invited on juries, need to give public lectures, etc. Within the profession, uh, I think there was a very good discussion in the morning and I've learned a lot. But, you know, the, the employers need to be very conscious of that. And none of this is actually happening much in India. Then in design and policy, we need to be gender mainstreaming. I went to Vienna earlier this year and I learned so much from them of what can be done. 
And basically, I think we all need to work towards developing an alternative model so that women become comfortable and they can find a work-life balance. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Burns. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that our panel meets here today in the traditional country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Beginning in 1835, they were dispossessed of the land on which we sit, but they never ceded it. And the long struggle for recognition of Indigenous sovereignty, social justice, spatial justice and judicial justice continues today. I offer my respect to their ancestors and their elders, their leaders, past, present and emerging, and I offer respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and First Nations people in this audience. I'd also like to thank Dean Julie Willis for inviting me to the panel and thank the conveners of the conference for their tireless hard work. So, I'm going to discuss just one project that I'm working on, collaboration with Professor Laurie Brown from Syracuse University, that's due out in late 2021. We're only a third of the way through this enormous project, however, so I can only discuss our approach rather than really presenting findings. The book's time span, 1960 to 2015, covers the years in which women began to enter the architecture profession in greater numbers. It also coincides, importantly, with seismic shifts in society and culture in the late 20th century. With the emergence of new nation states and state building in the wake of decolonisation, with civil rights struggles, the land rights struggles by First Nations peoples, gay rights, trans rights, disability rights, the environmental crisis. As well, global organisations such as the UN focused a global discussion on women's rights, albeit in a complex and fraught institutional environment. The book's end date marks the 40th year after the UN Declaration of 1975 as the International Year of Women. I have to say the mic and the paparazzi are making me feel like a rock star, and that's not something that happens very often, so thank you, MSD. <laughs> Our encyclopedia presents a geographical organisation of the field, and I'll talk about the reasons for that in a minute. It will be a two-volume hard copy publication accompanied by an online version. It will contain almost 1,200 separate entries from about 134 countries, organised into 11 regions with about um, 14 area editors. Almost 1,200 entries. I try to say this with <coughs> equanimity, but it's a terrifying proofreading loan, which Julie knows about as well. The entries are a mix of predominantly um, biographies, but also topic entries. Each region will be introduced with a 5,000-word essay from the area editors outlining the specific histories and geopolitical conditions in the region. And there'll be an overall editor's introduction by Laurie and I, as well as a global timeline that visualises and coordinates key events in the history of women in architecture and spatial practice. So that's the format. Let's just return um, to some of the key concepts that frame the book. There's a big shouty version of the word women in this configuration. Um, but women are one of the groups constructed as marginal to the discipline. This marginalisation of women in architectural history writing is produced by a number of mechanisms which we will discuss. Canonisation is one of them, as in a focus on stories of great masterworks produced by lone, rugged individuals. But this is only one of the mechanisms of marginality in the discipline. Other mechanisms rest on social norms of gender, ableism, sexuality and race that render certain human beings invisible or peripheral or allow their contributions to be claimed by others. And this is really important that our project is as much a critique of feminism and its focus on the global north, on centering Anglo-European women and the dominance of white feminist ideologies 
as it is a critique of the canon and the canon's decontextualising approach to architectural production. So the title has three identity categories in it, the global, women and architecture. The project disrupts the coherency of each of these categories by foregrounding differences. Firstly, the project is dedicated to mapping commonalities and differences amongst women's histories. We argue that a global project can question the common chronologies and geographies of women's rights and women in architecture. To briefly give you one example, it's very common for histories of women's rights to centre around suffrage. But this history is skewed by the racial constructions of empire. The 1902 Commonwealth Franchise Act in Australia removed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's right to vote in federal elections, a right which was not reinstated until 1962. 1962. In India, after the end of British imperial rule in 1947, women were granted the right to vote in 1950. I hope my research is right. Some feminist historians have argued that another more global starting point could be claims for women's access to education, which began uh, in the modern period in early 18th century China before happening in Western Europe in the late 18th century, or the arguments that were made for the social emancipation of women in early 19th century India. Angela Davis, in her book, Women, Race and Class, argues that organising around women's rights in North America began in the abolitionist campaigns of the 1830s. In the US, it's been argued, race-based movements served as precursors or windows of political opportunity for gender activism. And Kumari J. Wandena, in her book, Feminism and Nationalism in the Third World, argues that in Asia, the movement towards women's emancipation was acted out against a background of nationalist struggles, which I think Madhavi has demonstrated as well. So our aspiration for the book is to try and net together women's individual agency, so you don't get distracted. I'm going back to the shouty slide. Um, to try and knit together women's individual agency and the historically determined conditions that foster and determine agency. Anurada Siddiqui's um, encyclopedia entry for the first woman Sri Lankan architect, Manette de Silva, does this very skillfully. There's just a fragment of Anurada's entry up here. She starts by noting that de Silva's parents had a Singalese burger marriage which crossed the protocols of racial boundaries and her parents' involvement in Sri Lankan independence and the universal franchise undergirded her rebelliousness and her interests and ambitions. In this fragment on the screen, Anurada notes that the campaigns for Indian independence interrupted de Silva's studies. In fact, she was expelled for striking um, in protest at Gandhi's arrest by the British. She's a multi-talented uh, person. Um, she had a transnational career. She's a very fine architect. She had a later teaching career at the University in Hong Kong. She also became a historian and wrote um, for the 18th edition, um, an entry on South Asia of Bannister Fletcher's A History of Architecture. So our project attempts to capture that interlocking of the transnational and the local in the direction and interests of women's lives. The intention is also to show how the interests and practices of individuals are shaped by specific historical contexts, structural factors and the other human actors and ideas in their lives. We are all interdependent, none of us are islands. The second key focus of the book is mapping an expanded sphere of architectural practice and that's the uh, reason for the very wordy part of our title, Women in Architecture, Not Women Architects. We highlight women with uh, careers with multiple folios or women who have careers as activists or pedagogues or historians or policy makers and it goes on. Take Phyllis Birkby, uh, educated at Yale, who then worked in New York on a number of projects for commercial offices until after coming out in 1973 in post-Stonewall environment of New York, she resigned from her commercial job and started her own practice. She was an important lesbian rights activist. She, in fact, she edited the first anthology of lesbian writing, 
She was a filmmaker, a writer, an educational innovator, co-founding the Women's School of Planning and Architecture in 1974. Now, this commitment to a broad definition of practice may mean that sometimes our regional advisory groups recommend including women who have had no quote-unquote formal architectural training, but whose impact on the built environment discipline is so immense that it's difficult to imagine the discipline without them. Joss Boyce and I talked about this on Monday because Joss has been involved in the group uh, putting together the UK list and she has written an entry on the disability rights activist Maggie Davis who was co-designer of the first housing uh, project to allow differently abled people to live outside institutions and also co-founder of the independent living movement. We discussed as well the important inclusion of Baroness Doreen Lawrence whose 19-year-old son, Stephen, a black British architecture student, was brutally murdered by racists in 1993. Uh, Baroness Lawrence has gone on to campaign against the inept policing of the murder, which was found to be, quote, institutionally racist. She established the Stephen Lawrence Trust, which, amongst other projects, has provided 130 bursaries for students who would normally have difficulty accessing architectural education. In the Africa section, Hannah LaRue has assembled a great range of individual biographies and varied topic entries that range from pedagogy to a category on UN women to a topic entry on ethnologists and historians of women's vernacular architecture and a varied range of spatial typologies such as women in the manufacturing space. So this list equally emphasises everyday space as well as formally architecturally designated space. And I'm finishing now. So this project puts local agency and local knowledge at its centre. This approach fosters diversity and difference, mapping the different trajectories of women's rights, human rights, and the salient agents, organisations, and conditions for women's varied practice in the global built environment. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to the first of my questions. Why do we do this? Why do we try and recover this history? What's important about it? <laughs> or is it so self-evident that it's just obvious that we should? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple of different reasons, I think. and. Um, I think one of the most important things is that it's a resource for contemporary struggles and contemporary organising. That um, history, particularly for groups that have been marginalised and unrepresented in the formal archives, um, it's a way of forging a collective identity, and that's really important. It consolidates that political sensibility and that sensibility of identity. I think it also is very validating. It's a way of um, sort of um, authorizing um, people who are, you know, who are operating outside of the norm to exist in this field by looking backwards and sort of understanding um, that there are many ways of being um, historically and today. Mm -hmm. You can't be with what you can't see. I know that was brought up earlier. And um, history is one of the great places where we look for ourselves, I think. I think uh, for you know, having role models, it's very important. And we generally have, you know, male role models, but uh, for, uh, especially when the student body is like 50% uh, women, they need to have these historical role models as well as contemporary role models. Can I unpack that a bit? Because I agree role models are important, but is it the idea that women were working in earlier times or is it actually what they were doing and saying? Sometimes it's quite contested at what they're doing and, and how they're presenting themselves. I know and had interviewed a whole series of women who said, no, I didn't face any discrimination. And, yes, you did. <laughs> um, there, there are different norms back then. There are different choices that are possible. Sometimes those choices that they are either forced to make or make willingly are not the choices that we would want... Um, younger generations to necessarily emulate. Is there, is there difficulty here in, in the role models that present from history? Yeah. 
But women still say now they have had no problem. The successful women, at least that I talk to, say, oh, I have had no problem being a woman. And then they just don't empathize with the rest of the struggling uh, women. So I don't think things have changed so much. I think it's great. I think it's equal opportunity to have um, flawed role models of all stripes and colors. I think, um, you know, Lena Bobardi is one uh, role model I personally have, right? I discovered when I was traveling in Brazil and I was like, you know, I've ne uh, how have I never heard of this brilliant woman? And, you know, unpacking our history, there's a lot to really uh, question about her work. And I think that's actually great. You know, I think it's kind of, um, you know, we can't expect all women, I mean, I think even expecting all women to be, you know, uh, angelic, heroes, nice, um, wonderful uh, saviors of our you know, of each other, you know, is, is part of a problem too. I like these sort of contested histories. I think that's kind of really important to, to show women kind of fighting, going against the grain. And, and if it's um, unsavory sometimes, well, there are plenty of men who are also unsavory characters, so I think that's okay. I think, too, it's about recognising that women is not... It's not a stable thing across history. So one issue is projecting back our own identity desires into that history, but another thing is coming to terms with the way in which gender norms are socially produced and historically configured. So it's not uncommon um, for women who trained in the 40s or 50s to say, I'm not happy, I never want to be known as a woman architect or a female architect, because their only experience of that term was as a derogatory term and the belief that the two things couldn't go together. Yeah. And I know there are women architects who feel like that and I completely empathise. I don't want to be called a woman architectural historian either. I'm happy to be called a feminist, but not a woman, which I think essentialises my identity for me. And so I think, you know, it's about, you can just, you can project back, but you, you're probably going to encounter some of these historical knots as well. And we found that very much in the project that we've been doing. And I think for us, what's been really interesting about uncovering these stories, these women, have been that they're all very, very different, as you know, as we've referred to earlier, and um, that they have obviously gone on this, their own journey, um, and that we identify with them in different ways. And I think even it's, it sounds so obvious, yet you know, why is this important? But you know, I was like 42, and Suzanne and myself are sitting there having a conversation, realizing. I had never seen a woman with white hair or grey hair on a stage talking about architecture or on any platform talking about architecture. You know, and I used to go to all the lectures we were talking about this earlier with Justine. I used to go to all the lectures. I was really keen, you know, I did everything. You know, and I hadn't actually seen that until I was, you know, practicing for a good sort of 15 years. Um, and that's why it's important because these women were there and they were doing work. And um, you could obviously learn so much from that. So, no, I. I, I I think uh, we went to London for the X100 exhibition and Nicola and myself both went down and we were like furious, you know. Why are we only finding out about this now? So, you know, the work, you know, the, the work that everybody here is doing is, is fundamental. I think part of it though also, and I think going back to Karen's, um, Karen's point, is to um, be cognizant of showing these, you know, figures on, on their own and decontextualizing these women, you know. Um, you know, women are an underrepresented group in our history books, but um, to sort of um, isolate them as a category and isolate them as, a, uh, as historical actors, I think is something that, you know, I'm hoping to sort of... Um, diffuse a little bit in my work, you know, promoting feminist histories. Um, you know, if we're doing that a bit in our exhibition, um, sort of not just women, but showing those linkages and alliances that, you know, women have been involved in. Um, I think that's something that also that's sort of coming up for me as well. I'm just interested in this sort of, uh, where women have done things that are, are somehow not expected so some of the women that I've looked at consciously rejected the the way that they were being categorised. So they said, oh, you know, they always want us to design the kitchen cupboards because they think we're good at cooking. <laughs> um, and But they actually made choices that, that, in rejecting that, they then went into healthcare work, um, which was another kind of mar marginalisation because... They said, "Oh well, you know, we're seen as being more caring, and I, could, uh, you know, I could work in this area." 
And you look at it and you go, well, it, it, it's not that sort of hero architecture. Um, and you ha you've ended up making a choice that's not quite yours, but sort of yours. It's quite difficult to put forward as somehow this blazing a trail other than just being there. But it becomes more complicated. And in inevitably, they're the handmaiden to the, the male partner. Um, and in one instance, uh, with the woman architect leading say, the development of the Royal Melbourne Hospital in the late 1930s, whenever the hospital administrators raised questions about um, there being a woman in charge, she'd just substitute in the nearest man um, <laughs> and you'd see her initialing the documents. But the, if you don't read the history properly, she just sort of disappears. It's like taken away. So these, they're, they're, qu they're quite complex ways of operating at times. And I understand they're contextualised, but it becomes hard to put these women on a pedestal because they feel quite compromised. But then maybe you don't put them on a, we don't need to put them on a pedestal. Yeah. You don't need to put architects on pedestals. <laughs> At all. They do it so well by themselves. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing is too, before the late 1960s, most of the women who went to university came from elite families. That was the only way you could go to university in Australia. I'm not sure about the states. So we're looking at women who bring a certain kind of socioeconomic agency to bear, and it's not to be surprised that they have some self-confidence in being rebellious. I think it depends what period you're looking at too, like the period we're looking at. Um, a lot of women find agency and mobility, um, so they're able to travel for education and then make decisions about whether they go back to their country of origin or move on somewhere else. So you see that one of the really important ways that women have been able to assert agency of, over conditions that are not of their own making is to move sideways, which is what you're talking about. And so you find agency and movement slipping through the cracks, deciding to expand your multi sort of skilled practice, going to from South Africa to the AA, from Johannesburg for Denise Scott Brown or Manette de Silva, finally allowed into the AA, you know, because they decide that they will let in Indian students after independence. So. Um, whereas I know you've been dealing with Victoria, so I don't know if there was that kind of mobility available to women in that period that you were looking at. Well, mostly I, I look pre-1950, yeah. um, perhaps not as much mobility as yep. uh, later. Later, yeah. I have found that uh, because, you know, practising is very difficult, a uh, lot of young graduates in India go abroad if they can afford to do a master's. Also, there is a pressure from, in the middle class, there is a pressure from the parents to get married. So, to get away from all that, they move. Yep. And many of them don't come back, you know, they settle down. So, yes, mobility, I think, yeah. is one way that they manage. So, how does this, this knowledge um, reshape our understanding of the present? How does it change the way we think as we recover these histories, what, what does it put upon us to think differently, to do differently, to shape and present history differently? Oh, well, we have pretty specific goals for that with our exhibition, if I can speak to that. Um, I mean, right now it's on, I mean, it's been traveling through eight different cities and right now it's on view at Cornell University, mostly to schools. Um, to directly inspire, you know? I, I mean, we, we are very clear about sort of wanting people to be able to see different models of activism um, because a lot of um, what motivated this in the first place, if I didn't say it before, was that, you know, we see a new wave of activism. We saw, you know, after Black Lives Matter, during Black Lives Matter, architecture students sort of wondering how their um, skills and their training somehow influence, like crosses over with this, you know, Me Too, women's, new women's movement. You know, how do these things interact? And, we, and they had no idea that there has been decades of action. Um, so it's our, our approach to this history sharing is directly to inspire, educate, provide models so that as um, Justine and, um, said before, as Parler said before, you know, to not reinvent the wheel, to sort of offer models um, 
even if it's in a 200 word blurb, to say that this is something we could think about. Um, we can potentially, you know, WISPA, the Women's School of Planning and Architecture, has come up a couple of times, and I'm looking at students in the audience thinking, like, have you guys ever thought about, you know, how you would start your own school if you could do whatever you wanted? Or, you know, Noelle Berkby, like, um, asking women to design their fantasy environments. Um, like, these models of practice, I mean, somebody came up with them. I mean, if we can re consider them. Um, I, we sort of want to directly, we want a direct pipeline between the history and contemporary action. I don't see history as an isolated thing. I, for me, it's part of the gender advocacy. And uh, just the fact that uh, they become historical figures, become visible, it helps the students, it helps the male practitioners. You know, so for me, it's a kind of a whole holistic thing that you know, you need to just do, to put it out in the public. And I think for me, one of the things that's enabled is to rethink the genre of biography, which is um, often a disdained practice in architectural history writing because it's been too easily conflated with PR. Mm. Um, and to really think about affect, which is emotional investment. So what, what kind of emotional investment we make when we read biographies, and these, that's a, a sort of fancy theoretical way of talking about projection and desire, and it's made me think that the canon itself is basically a whole lot of affective desires, a set of emotions. We think about the canon as this thing set in stone, you know, it's been, because people have been cited over and over again there in the canon. But what if the canon is there because it's a projection of people's desires into it? You know, what is the desire to connect with and see oneself mirrored in Le Corbusier and Corbusier's career? And, um, and, and I think that partly happens because in a way, Architectural careers don't have a lot of defined boundaries, you know, so the, those connections we're looking for people, we're drawn to people who may represent our own aspirations or, or give us an idea about a sort of life path. And I think that's talking about that emotional connection is really important. That's another way of exploring the complexity of the canon's resilience resistance to change. So are we just doing the same thing then? Are we just creating an alternative canon that projects, as you're suggesting? Some feminist, so some writers of uh, histories of women architects do. Yeah, it's the great individuals and their masterworks. A bit yeah. decontextualised. There's nothing wrong with those books either. They're really important um, and they have a place, and I, I, but I think as a historian, um, you come with a whole set of other requirements of the kind of work you do, and that's that's why I talked about trying to trying to write feminist histories, which is a different project. And that's the thing I was thinking about when you were talking about, you know, what, how does that inform what you do today? I mean, I think picking up on the point of the Sharon was making about you know, not using the master's tools um, and just thinking differently about how we record uh, what we do, how we do it, how we include um, stories about everybody that's involved in it, that be true to the process of actually making um, and the, how that's a you know, broad and rich textured process that involves so many different people. And I think we've actually found um, by talking, you know, focusing very much um, women in that kind of interwar or post-war period and their careers, um, you know, they were obviously given particular opportunity and they talk very, very uh, openly about the collaborative nature of the work and the communities they're working with, the clients they're working with, the teams they're working with, human geographers, you know, all of these um, other disciplines. And I think that's what we've taken you know, this is something that's con you know sort of presented as a contemporary idea of collaboration. You think, no, this is obviously this is this has already happened. Mm -hmm. It is kind of funny, though. I have to note. I mean, it's it's no coincidence that you know a couple of the same images have appeared yeah. two or three times in this conference already. I I always almost wonder if we're seeing a little bit of a canon forming around these feminist histories of this 1970s to 80s. You know, um, around these certain figures that we're sort of using as sh a shorthand. I mean, they're great you know, examples. Um, and there are, they do allow us to tell a shorthand of a story because we can't tell all of them at once. So who are these sacrificial, I, I guess it's not a sacrificial lamb, but it's a sort of token um, example of a couple of activist groups like WISPA. Yeah, but 
Phyllis Birkby isn't recognised in the architectural mainstream right. at all. I mean, Laurie and I were talking about it. She's been written out. So to show her a couple of times as a, fe at a feminist or a conference on women in architecture, that, you know, where is the work being shown? Where does it circulate? Who knows about it? So it's situational and those things are really important. It's not going to stop the onslaught of books about Peter Eisenman or you know, people <laughs> like that, <laughs> which my yeah. students, you know. And so I think yes. we have to think about that too. We, we might all feel like we know this knowledge, but it's not inscribed in the annals at all. Let me put my faintly Corbusian glasses on. <laughs> um, so how does challenging the canon cause us to reevaluate our roles as historians or history writers? Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Surely it means that we have to do things differently. We can't behave as sort of the normal historian in doing this. First of all, the archive's not easily accessible. How do we do things differently when we look at this material? Or you don't? Oh, no, it's just... <laughs> oh. I think um, one of the, I think oral history is a really powerful tool um, and it's a, a, a feminist historians, you know, it, this is a, a sort of emerged out of the women's movement actually as a historical tool um, to sort of um, write history not um, from the all-knowing historian who knows it, you know, who knows it all, but to enter history as someone asking questions and allowing the subjects to speak for themselves. Um, Columbia University has a whole uh, department devoted to the um, study, a master's degree in oral history, and um, they have a good crossover with the architecture school, so a couple of us are getting trained in this technique of going out into the field and allowing histor like subjects to tell their own experiences. I think that's a... That was, for me, a nice way of reimagining um, the history writer. I was working for uh, Kenneth Frampton at the time, who is the textbook writer, you know, uh, or wasn't, for my, in my experience. And, um, and to be able to sort of um, learn that other way of, of learning was a really emancipatory way to, for me to approach um, the idea of how we collect histories, but, that when they aren't written or even acknowledged in the archive where I happen to find my favorite topic. So the professional training as a historian is to develop um, a critical perspective, you know, through, through the bringing to bear of theory or sources. Mm -hmm. And I think there are really important ethical questions that come with oral history writing. I've been working with oral histories as well. But when you're telling the story of someone whose experience has been marginalized mm -hmm. and she's been rendered invisible despite 50 years of practice, then I think there's an ethical responsibility in the transcription of, of her account of her life. And I'd say that for all marginalised people. So that, that demand as a professional historian to then bring this critical voice to bear, that is very difficult. And I think that critical voice has to retreat in the ethical retelling of that story. I mean, we've... <laughs> I mean, like I say, I'm a practitioner, so, um, but uh, as, a, as, um, as we go through this process of, of the voices and we're recording, you know, you then feel this duty, to, well, we've got yeah. this information, what do we do with it, how do we present it, how is it documented, how is it, where is it stored, and it's raised lots of kind of ethical questions for us, um, and um, in a way, though, almost our naivety <laughs> um, is something that we're kind of hoping to use as a, to our advantage in the sense that, you know, I was quite shocked when I realised transcriptions are not actually exactly what was said. And that there's a practice of transcription, there's a method. You think, well, why is it that method and not another method? And, you know, why is it not more like poetry where you describe, you, 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 the words appear as they were, like, experienced in time and space? And so, actually, I think we're starting to have those kind of conversations. We're working with some curators at the moment who are looking at that with us and taking our transcriptions the way they've been professionally transcribed then re-listening to them again and thinking, well, what's left out? Why was that left out? What's important? Those kind of environmental aspects of being in a place and are they documented, they record anywhere. So there's incidental things. And actually, so there's a, again, there's a, whole, there's a whole conversation to be had around that. But I think um, through, the, through doing our project, it's really 
raised very starkly that question about how, how you document, how you record, and the responsibility that comes with that. And I think it goes back to Julie's point earlier about the power of silences. I mean, yeah. we've been talking about erasure and invisibility, but the stories that people may never want to tell, mm -hmm. you know, the lacuna in, pe in people's personal histories, that's powerful too. And as a historian, one of the things you do is try and sort of speculate a about those absences in the way people present themselves. So. Um, as, I, as I said, I try to look into the personal... Uh, I think as a woman historian, with you have a different kind of empathy trying to collect the data. And for me, the cultural and the social is as important as the professional. Mm. So it's how you represent what the material you get is also going to be different or challenging the canon. So I think we all sort of struggle with how to put this together. Yeah, I mean, one of the funniest, I don't know, it's funny, I, I found it funny, we, we were recording one of our participants, Jocelyn's an incredible conservation architect, and uh, she said, uh, so we, were, did, we did the conversation, and she said, no, turn, turn it off, it's fine, we're finished. Said, oh, I'm glad. Yeah, turn it off, because this bit doesn't matter. And then she told this incredible story about Margaret Richard, who's this architect she really looked up to, who was, you know, one of the, you know, uh, real super designers at the time. I said, oh, and I had my first baby. She actually came round and she'd knitted me a, a cardigan for my baby. And I couldn't believe that, like, Margaret Richard had, like, knitted a cardigan. Like, she's so busy. Like, how did she come round personally to deliver it? And I was like, we turned the recording. <laughs> you know, because that wasn't something she felt she wanted to be documented. But actually, we were like, well, this is an incredible story about women supporting each other. And, you know, it was a quiet story, but... Yeah. I do find that, um, in some ways, the pressure to create the perfect story or the perfect bi biography means that we, we tend to tidy up the edges. Yeah. And, and instead of leaving them messy and unknown. And I'm, I'm now, as I work on sort of careers of architects, um, as a historian, I, I, I now find myself building up pictures over time that I might have written something once, and I go back and I look at it again, and I go and look for more sources, and I add something more in, so it's a continuous project instead of one that is beginning and end. And I think that there, we sometimes run the danger of just assuming that that discussion we've had is... That's all, all, instead of coming back and doing it again and understanding and layering it. the nuance and the layering that might occur. Yeah, I've done interviews with some of the karyatids when um, someone else was in the room or in the house, and I've gotten a completely different account than when we came back to redo it. Because, you know, uh, oral history practice, you sort of interview somebody once to sort of get the basics of the story, get the ideas out there, and then you do it again so that you go deeper into each of those um, memories. And so when her husband wasn't there, this completely different story emerged. <laughs> it was crazy. And um, so anyway, and in the end, she actually didn't authorize me to use the story because it was so, there's so much personal baggage with some of these feminist histories um, or histories of activists that, you know, we can't kind of tease out. I think it's really true that the personal and the professional are completely... Um, uh, intertwined and and yet I think these mundane details or seemingly mundane details that we wouldn't find in a history textbook really do are so telling you know about the larger stories of what and experiences of women architects and, and they humanize them and if we're yeah. looking for mentors and icons to have them humanized makes them resonate so much more to the generations that are following and yet you can understand the reasons why they might not do want to do this I think um, one of the really interesting things I think at the moment with me too is the secret histories of women's lives, the way they've had to keep these terrible secrets or just tell a few people around them. And that's happened to me when I've interviewed women and I've been told an explosive secret where I find out that a major university institution um, where sexual predation of, of lecturers towards students was just everyday part of studio practice if you wanted to pass the studio subject, and I've, I'm carrying that knowledge around with me, and so there are these ticking time bombs, and that immediately connects women's history to the canon. 
Yeah. Because there is that part of the canon that's not talked about. I was talking to a colleague the other day who's spent a number of years working on Le Corbusier's um, quite well-documented links with fascism. She find it very difficult to find an arena in architecture where she can show the evidence and tell that story. So these ticking time bombs, they're, they're there. Um, and that, that, that connection will connect, fuse these two histories together as well. History is constantly being rewritten. Mm. I think it's time to open up questions to the audience. Are there questions from the floor? No, you're all too fascinated by what we've been saying. Yes, up over oh, here. They're just tired. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. There's a question over here. Um, thank you all for sharing your presentations today. I have a um, sort of quick question about um, the content of the history that you're all talking about in relation to education and um, how these sort of subjects are received when you try to teach them in schools. I'm a student um, at the moment and have had like zero exposure to these, these histories unless you go out and you seek them on your own as a student. Um, do you get to teach the stuff where you come from? And, and how well received is it as like set in stone courses as part of curriculum? She's asking me. Anyone? Uh, Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I, I try to teach. I try to teach, but uh, the interest in these kinds of things is marginal. But uh, in my, where I used to teach, I taught uh, gender and architecture or gender and the Indian city as uh, subjects where I try to bring these things in. But yeah, you're right, it's not in the mainstream of teaching at all. Um, well, I'm really fortunate. I, I teach here and I teach a postgraduate post-1965 history. And so I teach the history that entwines all of these rights movements that emerged in the 60s and 70s, and I interweave that with mainstream canonical architectural history. So we start in 72 with the tent embassy in Canberra and the first detonation of Pruitt. I go, and then we move the week after to Venturi and Scott Brown, and then we get to Eisenman. So I'm tr actually trying to fuse these, <laughs> weave them in and out, which is... And the students generally enjoy it, although I did have one student in there um, student response last year who said I was a communist, which is what my father <laughs> used to say. <laughs> and Dad wasn't very happy about it either. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, as a, um, I'm often teaching history that's slightly earlier than what Karen's talking about, I, I do my best. Um, and for years and years and years, on the, on the exam for 20th century architecture, I just said, had a question that said, name a woman architect. <laughs> um, I didn't appreciate Louise Sullivan very much. As <laughs> I certainly didn't appreciate my name being put down there. Either. But um, They were just sucking up to you. They were sucking, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, but it was a signal to say, you need to know about this stuff. If you don't know, go look at it. And to try and talk about it and to try and invest it. But inevitably, they're, they're brief discussions in lectures or tutorials. They're not what's always being talked about. And it's really, really hard. I think it depends what you do as well. I mean, as part of my course, and I'm, I'm teaching master students, I take them down to the RMIT design archives and they bring out a whole lot of material. So about five or six of the students out of 32 are doing archive-based essays. Two of them are working on uh, women and feminism. The 70s, one on a project that um, Romberg designed for the Aboriginal community, um, others looking at sort of local housing activism against the Housing Commission, and they love it because it gives them agency, you know, in a subject that can just be having to read Kenneth Frampton or... Um, I hope this isn't being live-streamed to him at his retirement home. Um, <laughs> And so, and to give them that sense of hands-on, and then you can find things in the archive that mirror, again, that thing about mirroring your own desire. But that's at uh, postgraduate level. But it'd be terrific to be able to do that sort of thing at undergraduate level as well. Absolutely. 
Yeah, um, we, I'm oh, sorry, just really quick. Um, I haven't taught it as a history class, and I'm hoping my colleague Andrea Merritt, who's just getting on the job market with all of this history now, she's going to produce a book. It's going to be great. Um, she will be the, one of the top resources for this in the US. Um, but I have been able to incorporate it into a studio for the first year studio, using some of these um, projects as precedents for kind of a crazy studio assignments, which has been fun. Now, I know there's a question just here, and then there'll be some down the front. Well, I think there is a point um, that some of you have made, which is um, disrupting even what the profession means. And that it's actually disrupting also what the discipline is. Mm -hmm. um, and you were touching on that, Karen. And when you do that, when we understand um, the built environment in a more inclusive way or in a broader way. Um, there are ways to include women um, as clients, as patrons, yeah. as that doesn't necessarily start in the 1960s. Then you can actually go back, way back, and, and start to intertwine their stories in what mainstream history is. Um, and there are efforts in that direction. Yeah. And um, thinking about this conference also is how do we rethink the profession? How do we rethink the way we teach it so that we stop as students or, you know, ha having gone through our studies without having been told about uh, these things? How, how do we change that? change the fact that you haven't been told about it or that it's always been diverse which how do we make it part of of um the curriculum the the you know let's not have another architect that gets out of architecture school without knowing the name of a women architect louise sullivan sorry <laughs> I think it's also incumbent upon the students, you know, to, I mean, to search for yourselves, too. I mean, it's, it's sometimes, a, you know, a burden to place on you guys, but I think it shows a lot of initiative. You know, when you really care about something or if it's something that you are really passionate about, it's really, it's, there are resources, it takes a little bit of work. If you don't have that spiritual guide in your university, in your department, um, how can, there are, they, they're ex online. You know, um, and you can contact any of us, and I'm sure we can. Well, people have been um, writing about an expanded. Well, architecture's always been diverse. I mean, it wasn't professionalised till the 19th century, but people have been doing this work for 50 years. All right, there's quite a lot of material around. So then it comes down to a, um, a pointy discussion about power, and you know, what is the power that keeps. Um, mainstream histories in place? Um, what are people's investments in having those histories there? And even within our project, there are um, divergent voices, people who think it should just be a history of women who've done design and construct, others who want it to be a really radical encyclopedia um, of, of um, radical activists. So within uh, feminist or women's history writing, there's a whole series of diverse positions, but that relationship to power is really important. 50 years, so what keeps the canon in place? And I think one of the really amazing things about the last five years is that a radical change in universities has been driven from the ground up by students. You know, if you think about Roads Must Fall, which started in South Africa and then spread to England and the large campaigns around racism in UK universities. If you think about the whole sort of discussion about sexual harassment and rape in university campuses, you know, students have been really powerful in that. So um, you can do the individual inquiry, but working co coalition building and activism as a group. And to ask that question, why aren't there? You know, why is this course constructed like this? Um, we, we're a diverse group of students. We want to see diversity reflected in our curriculum. That's a great thing to ask your professors too for your design reviewers, um, for the jurors, for the lecturers, whenever you see that gap. I think, you know, mm. 
You and have a lot of power. Oh, sorry. And also that your education doesn't stop when you leave this institution. You know, it, you know, for myself, I think about, you know, almost like a citizen historian <laughs> type thing. You know, you find if it's not there or if it wasn't presented to you at a certain point in your training, you, you can find it at any point. Um, and challenging institutions as well, those when we talk about power, um, who gets invited to talk, who gets invited to pub publish, um, and just challenging that. You know, we, we even now, you know, if, if you see a, an event and it's just, as you've seen, something you've already seen before, panel if you already heard before, just don't go. I think, I mean, one <laughs> of what with your feet, you know, sort of thing. One of the most, um, skewed things about the discipline of architecture is that it's, it's the profile and careers of the 1% <laughs> that are peddled to everybody else as the model of their architecture career and most people will end up being everyday architects and I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all, I mean where it's part of your life and your practice but we're consuming the histories of um, you know, the people who get these extraordinary cultural projects with hundreds of millions of dollars attached to them. And that 1% drives um, the image and, the sh and, and what looks like um, a successful career in architecture. So there's a, there's a broader question about the way in which the discipline, the media, the profession fails to narrate histories of a standard life in architecture. I think, uh, it's, I think it's not fair to leave the onus on the student, like the panel has been doing. I, I think it was a very genuine question and unfortunately, I think when the women's histories gather critical mass, they may be forced to include it into the mainstream curriculum, but it's again going to take time. We have time for one more question and I know one up the back very yes, keen. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a fantastic panel. One of the things that strikes me about gatherings like this is the collective knowledge that's all in the room. And um, I'm going to ask each of you on the panel if you had the opportunity to interview or tell the story of someone past, present or emerging that we might not know about, who would that be? Panelists. It's <laughs> a big question. Um, I would tell uh, the story of Roberta Washington, who's one of our um, co-curators and who has never, as far as I know, had a complete oral history done of her life. She was the first registered black architect in New York, if I'm not. No, not by a long shot. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> one of the first. Her claim to fame is being the owner of the largest continuously operated black female-owned architecture firm. Owner of the largest continuously operating black-owned architecture firm. Um, she, female black art owned architecture firm. Um, she's a historian also of the early black architects, uh, black women architects especially, um, and she's taken on all of these leadership roles through, the, through all of that alongside of her practice. So I'm, I think she has been through so many um, moments in the um, women's movement, and I think that she, her story really should be told a lot more. I would do Yuli Chaudhary that I showed on the screen, the one who worked with Le Corbusier. She's no more. But I found her personality extremely interesting and uh, she was multi-talented, etc. I would really love to know more about her. She had a job in the US, but when she found out that Corbusier was doing Chandigarh, she left the job and came back. And I think there is a lot to learn from her. Um, and remembering that um, biography is a projection of, of desire. I would tell the story, people from the UK know this woman, but people here won't. A woman called Diana Lee Smith, who's Anglo-Kenyan, who went to Kenya in the late 1960s to teach there, you know, in the aftermath of decolonisation. She's been there most of the time ever since. She went to the first UN Habitat Women's Conference in Vancouver in 75. She's worked inside and outside the UN. She developed married women's property rights 
which is something that makes an enormous difference to women's lives across the world. With her partner, she co-designed the memorial to the Mau Mau veterans in Nairobi, and she's working on the urban food plan for Nairobi, and she's in her late... 70s, and so she is an extraordinary woman. I'm full of admiration for the career she's had and the choices that she's made. Yeah, I find it's hard to answer, um, but maybe um, the person that, I, I, that we've met actually, who we haven't, I don't think her full story has been told, is Kirsten Borland, who's one of the women that we've interviewed who's consistently. She was a planner, she's involved in like one of the major. Um, strategic plans uh, for, for our city, um, the Clay Valley Regional Plan, and worked in a team when she was very, very young, and uh, trained in kind of experimental uh, tutoring down in London when she was young. And I think the reason probably I would like to hear more about her work and have it documented is that she's consistently trying not, to, you know, she's consistently modest and trying to prevent us telling that story on her behalf. And I think that that's, it's a story I'd like to hear from uh, more about, yeah. And I'm going to jump in too because um, in this university uh, we had a huge number of Asian students come and uh, be educated here from the 1950s under the Colombo Plan and amongst them were women. And I want to know their stories because I know quite a lot about some of the males but I know virtually nothing about the women and it's one of the projects I want to do next. I think that's the point we need to draw this to a close because afternoon tea beckons before we reconvene to hear the fabulous Joss boys uh, in only a sort of few-ish minutes. So uh, please join with me in thanking this fabulous panel. <laughs>